Thank you. The chair recognizes Mr. Olson. I thank the chair and welcome to our five witnesses. Well, low Earth orbit is getting real crowded, huh? This SSA and STM started October 4th of 1957 with the launch of the Sputnik 1 satellite. Now, the challenge is there because she was powered for maybe a week or two, came down after 21 days, no collision, chances up there in orbit, but that started then. Right now, though, that world has changed, as you all know. We have over 9,000 satellites up there orbiting right now. Almost two-thirds are dead, out of fuel, mission complete. One-third are actually viable right now. We do have an idea what happens if we have a collision. Intentional collisions with China, anti-satellite missile firing, and uh, I guess it looks right around 2007. Our debris in that graph you put up there, Dr. Whedon, doubled almost overnight with that missile shot. That was intentional. Y'all scared me pretty earlier talking about the crisis over Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Those two satellites coming at each other about 32,000 miles rate of closure came about the width of this room from a collision. 500 miles over Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, almost have a collision the size of this room. That had been catastrophic. Having grown up about two miles to the Johnson Space Center, my main goal is to make sure that those human beings who've been there now for 20 straight years on orbit every single day do not have any impact from some satellite debris that we control their safety. And it's not just for America. Now. We are now the world's space travelers. China is doing a little bit, both us, Russia, ESA, we are dominating space flight the entire world. And so I want to make sure we're we're proactive instead of reactive with this debris field that's growing. That means SSA is, pro, is proactive. That's what we should do. STM is kind of reactive. And so I think nothing helps us more with being proactive than artificial intelligence. I'm the co-chairman of the House AI Caucus. And so my question for all of you is, what role does AI play? in the world of SSA. Dr. Stilwell. I am not an expert in artificial intelligence, and I think it's only responsible to defer to those who are. Dr. Wood. Thanks so much for the introduction and for the questions. Uh, I want to highlight one of the things we've been discussing is the practices and what it means to have healthy practices that reduce uh, the uncertainty. So those begin actually during the design phase of a satellite before it even goes to space. There are actions that operators can take, including how they use tools like artificial intelligence uh, to understand how they're going to be the best operator they can, how they're going to know where their satellite is, share that uh, hopefully with their own government and with other operators through groups like the Space Data Association. Then some teams are interested in using SS, uh, artificial intelligence to help figure out how to operate their satellite. It's actually an emerging technology, and it's interesting, but it also creates confusion, meaning uh, if you operate your satellite and you use an algorithm partly uh, informed by artificial intelligence to plan when you want to maneuver from one orbit to another, that could be interesting technically, but it also creates more uncertainty for other operators around you to know where you're going to be at a given time. So actually, I think it's an open academic research question and operational question. Uh, but certainly, we do, as the space community, want to take advantage of the benefits of these tools. But I think overall, we want to say uh, operators should be incentivized both by government requirements as well as by peer pressure among uh, the, the commercial community uh, to do what they can in the design phase and in the operation phase to be as transparent as possible. That means better uh, communicating where you are, uh, then better having the right physical objects on your satellite so you can track yourself. We need to be able to identify and track objects. But we can also use AI to, uh, artificial intelligence uh, as we try to understand the complex behavior of satellites in space. So multiple answers. Thank you. Ms. Grabinowitz. Remembering I'm a lawyer and not a scientist, I, I agree with Dr. Stilwell that you need to ask uh, AI experts. But from a legal perspective, two of the most important things you're going to have to deal with if you're going to be using AI is intellectual property rights. Yeah and liability. 
Mr. Otrogi, if I pronounce it. Thank you. Yes, you did. <laughs> um, let's see. Um, I'm, I'm a person who feels that a holistic approach is, is very important here. We have, we have to try and address the threat of space debris through all avenues. AI is a very important one, and I think it needs to be uh, a heavy uh, area where we do research. The issue, though, is I, I, a lot of the data that would feed that AI, I feel today is not out there, and it's just not to the, that level yet. So uh, all, all across, we need to uh, pursue. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Dr. Weed. Uh, yeah, I just want to echo what Dan said. I was going to say the same thing. A lot of what we call AI is actually machine learning algorithms, and, a lot, and they're essentially only as good as the data you feed them. And, and, and to echo what Dan just said, we don't have the underlying data in a point where we have enough of it. We understand its precision, its accuracy, its confidence. We don't really understand it at the point where I would feel confident to feed that into an algorithm at this point in time. So I think we start with fixing the, the data, get a better handle on that, and then yes, I think we're gonna have to move to an area where we adopt things like machine learning, other things to help improve the situation. I'm out of time. On behalf of our chairwoman, can you all say hook them? <laughs> Anybody? I'm from New York. No, sorry. <laughs> I yield back. I thought you would have learned your lesson, 